Hi guys, this is Christina and I wanted to share something with you all that I have not yet shared but it's been on my heart to share for a while and that is my testimony, uh, my story of um, how I came to faith and how God just led, us, led me on this journey to where I am now. Many of you of course have been following PD and I's journey when I first came on the scene. Just everything that God did and all the miracles that he did to bring us together um, from PD over in South Africa and me here in America, Virginia. <laughs> um, just wow, how he opened up the Red Sea on so many occasions and made the impossible possible. Um, so anyways, but of course for many of you, um, who am I? <laughs> uh, I want to share who I am and my story and my testimony as well. So kind of going back, uh, I first, my family, we attended a when I was young, we attended a non-denominational church, and that's where I first encountered Jesus. And you know, I was of course very young, but I loved the, the Bible stories. I loved Jesus, and at a certain point, I you know I really wanted to become baptized because I understood in my heart and I knew what it meant, and I desired to become baptized because I loved Jesus so much, and and I wanted Him to be my Savior. So that was when I was young. I was about. I guess you could say eight years old, seven, eight years old. It was around that time though, that something radical happened that totally changed my life and my family's life. What happened was one day, my mom was reading through the Bible and she happened to be reading Leviticus 23. Now as she read Leviticus 23, she came across these, these festivals, these feasts, and she was like, you know, God, as she read these, these, these feasts, she's like, God, these, these festivals that you gave to, to Israel, these, these Jewish feasts, you, can, I, can I celebrate these feasts too? Can I keep these Jewish feasts too? Because she just really felt like in her heart in that moment that, wow, these are, these are beautiful. Can I, can I keep these Jewish feasts? And she was asking God, can I, am I allowed to? And that's when she heard the Father's voice speak to her so clearly. These are not Jewish feasts. These are my feasts. These are my appointed times. If you go back to Leviticus 23, I believe it's even verse one. God doesn't say, and behold, these are the feasts given to the Jews and only the Jews. Actually, he says something very different. He says, these are my appointed times given to my people. So what's funny about that is that if you follow God and you love God and you are part of his people because you love him, you serve him, you're grafted in, then these are for you too because they're his feasts. So if you love him, then guess what? You can love these gifts, these feasts that he's given you because why? They're not only for one, for just the Jewish people, though they were entrusted to the Jewish people and they were given first to them so that they can take them and become a light to the nations. And so that all the nations can see the beauty, the truth in God's word and God's law and these festivals. And so when we become, when we follow after the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, we become grafted into Israel. And in that same way, these festivals that God gave and that he called his appointed times are for you too. Because why? They're appointed times because they're appointments. They're pointing towards something. And PD has done teachings how these each festival points to Yeshua. Each festival reveals something deeper in the gospel story. And it, points to, and it shows a different part of the story. Passover pointing to Yeshua's sacrifice as our Passover lamb. First fruits showing how he was the first fruits of those who raised from the dead, even as Paul talked about how he rose from the dead on the same day as the festival of first fruits. Or think about Shavuot, which is the festival of the harvest in the Torah. And on the exact same day of Shavuot, which we call Pentecost in the New Testament, in Acts 2, what happened? At the beginning of a greater harvest, when the Holy Spirit fell upon those the disciples who were there and on those who were in Jerusalem. And it says 3,000 believed. It was the beginning of a greater harvest on the same day of Shavuot, the harvest festival. So as my mom heard the father's voice tell her, these are my appointed times. She really just desired like, wow, I, I, wanna, I wanna 
celebrate them. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it, but I want to, I want to celebrate these festivals. So that began a long, fun journey in my family as we decided that we were going to do this. We decided that we would celebrate Passover. Now I will say as a child, when we've been um, having our Easter bunnies, our chocolate Easter bunnies, and when you exchange that for a matzah, which is unleavened bread, it's like a cracker, it's not very flavorful. When you exchange the chocolate for the matzah, it's not the biggest exciting thing in the world for you, it's kind of a letdown, <laughs> especially when you're a child. Um, <laughs> but God saw our hearts, especially my mom's heart, as she um, walked out what he had laid on her heart to do. And so we had our first Passover Seder. I was probably about, oh, eight, almost nine. It was in that time frame. And when we had our first Passover Seder, I can just imagine the Father looking down on us with just, just smiling because we didn't know what we were doing, but we just had a desire to honor Him and to keep these festivals that He gave as a gift. And He said were His appointed times. And so we had literally a plate with some matzah and we had a Bible we had some maror, which is bitter herbs. Bitter herbs are bitter, they're not very tasty. So we had a very, <laughs> as a child, I didn't think so fondly of that <laughs> in the moment, but that was our first step towards honoring the festivals and honoring God and keeping the festivals that he's given us that point to and reveal Yeshua. Um, so that began our journey. We kept that first Passover Seder and as the years went by, of course, we learned more and we started being able to celebrate the other festivals and have joy and excitement and incorporate fun things because, of course, there, there are times of um, fellowship with other believers and, and just a rejoicing in the goodness of the Lord. Um, and of course, now that we also have, we believe in Yeshua, we know that Yeshua has come and he came to be the sacrifice to, to rise from the dead so that we can have that life through him and how he also is coming back and he's returning one day. We were able to see that deeper meaning in each of the festivals. So that was a major turning point in my life, in my family's life, as we sought to honor and to love the Lord in keeping these days, these feast days, these appointed times that he's given to all of his people. So that led us to going to a congregation where they kept these festivals, Passover and, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And we were there for um, many, many, many years, actually. Um, well, most of my, the end of my childhood through early teen years. And so my most, you could say my most memorable years. Um, I learned Hebrew dance. So I, I love dancing ever since I was about five years old, but there I was able to learn Hebraic dance. Um, which is really fun. I would encourage you, if you've never danced Hebraic dance before, you totally should learn. It's not just for girls. Actually, in Israel, which is that type of um, Davidic, Hebraic, um, Israeli dance, it's a lot of guys. You'll see them in a circle um, doing like the Hora. <laughs> There's some great videos of like IDF soldiers um, all doing that. Anyways, it's a great dance, but it's also, especially in the congregation, we would do it during worship. It was Hebraic, it was worship, Hebraic worship dance to the um, music. And it gave me another way to just worship the Lord, you know, with my whole body, which was just a wonderful thing to me. And that's always a passion he's given me, the Father's given me, to be able to, to worship him um, with everything and all that I am. So that's one thing I learned there. And we were also taught Hebrew. Um, and that's where I had my bat mitzvah. So bat mitzvah literally means, if you translate it, it means daughter of the commandments. And what a bat mitzvah is, um, the whole like the journey of what it means to become a bat mitzvah, a daughter of the commandment, means you study for a few years, about one to two years, um, about Israel, the history of Israel, you learn Hebrew, um, like in a traditional synagogue um, environment that doesn't believe in Yeshua, the traditional requirements are, you know, you learn Hebrew, you study Israel, um, you study the Torah, and you, things of that nature. There's a lot of great things there that are just powerful um, in learning these, this history. Um, there's a lot more to it as well. I'm just giving a brief. But of course, in the congregation we went to, they believed in Yeshua, the Messiah, and so we incorporate all of that into training to be a bat mitzvah. And the end, the end part of becoming a bat mitzvah, after you, you've been learning Hebrew, you, um, you're learning things like respecting your elders and serving and becoming a member of the congregation in a way that is you're serving others who are older, who are younger, and becoming, um, yeah, and doing that. The last step to become a bat mitzvah was you had to write a sermon, or what we call a drash. 
you had to write a sermon based on the Torah portion, or that portion of the Bible that is read that week. You would write a sermon from that portion for that week. When I prepared to, to bat mitzvah and to have this final, this the final step to, to give the sermon, all, after all the study, after everything else that I had done, this was a point that really made me stop. Because it wasn't just, okay, I did this thing or I did that thing. It had to be now, wait, okay, it's not just what my mom has shared and what I, I've, I've learned and, you know, m my mom's truth in a sense. I've, I enjoyed going to the congregation. I enjoyed learning things, but this was now different. This was now what I had that the Father had laid in my heart to share, to speak, to teach. And I had to now not just listen to a teacher, I had to study for myself. I had to prepare this message in a way that would bless as well as even challenge those who were in the audience. And I was only about 14 years old. And so as I studied this out, as I studied the topic that the Lord laid on my heart, which was Yeshua revealed in the Passover, that's when I guess you could say my faith became real to me. It became personal to me because I had, I loved the Lord and I loved everything that I had been learning. But there was almost a little bit of a, a distinction between the grown-ups and, and me. I mean, I'm a child. I'm still a kid. You know, I'm a teen. <laughs> but that was the moment when it was, no, I'm a woman before God, before the Lord. And I have to study his word out for myself. Not just what, you know, this person says or what that person says or what my parents say. I have to study his word out for myself. And as I did and prepared for this message, God instilled a passion for his word in my heart that I had never really, I had a passion for his word, but I didn't have it in the same depth, in the same way, where just all of a sudden everything just started, my eyes started being opened to like, wow, I can see Yeshua here and here. And in these, like in Passover, I can see Yeshua in all these different intricate details. And this is so exciting. I got so excited about what God was revealing to me that I wanted to just share with everyone I knew. I gave the message and it was great. It was wonderful. I bought mitzvah. Now, of course, as I did this, I did come across something that perhaps some of us have also come across, we've all experienced. As I grew more and as I learned more, I started to become a little puffed up. <laughs> a little puffed up with the, the knowledge that I had acquired. It was all true. It was all truth from the Father. It was the treasures that He had revealed to me in His Word. But even treasures, if we apply it incorrectly, and that's what I started to do. It was something that God had revealed to me. And because I knew something and someone else didn't, I had something they didn't, you know? And I started to have pride. A little bit of arrogance too. I didn't, I was started to not walk in the same humility. And I started to not have the same love as I should have. I still loved the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I was zealous for His word and, and for His, His commandments. I was zealous to, 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 to follow His word. But in my zealousness, I let pride creep in. With what I had learned, overstepping the love that I was supposed to have. So when I speak with people and have discussions with them, I sometimes let pride speak instead of love speak. Instead of desiring that they would come to the same understanding that the Father had revealed to me and the, the seeing the beauty in the word that he had revealed, like, wow, isn't this so beautiful? And it started to become, I'm right, you're wrong. Let me show you how. And that was a period in time, in that growing time. I had that zealousness, but God had to still refine me. <laughs> and praise the Lord, he refines us like gold refined in fire. And sometimes it's not always comfortable because gold refined in fire, fire is not comfortable, it's fire, you know, but that's okay. It's needed so that we can become, we can look more like him. When we're that lump of clay that's lumpy, he needs to, you know, squish it and mold it and then put it back on the wheel so we can continue looking more beautiful, more like him. So as he poured these things into me and as I started growing more, that realizing, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't the way I should be sharing. 
God had to even, you know, humble me. Um, that I had those who were, who loved him, but didn't have some of the, the truths revealed to them that had been revealed to me. I learned things from them. I learned the love of Yeshua. I learned the humility. I learned the servanthood. I learned the caring for the widow, the orphan. I learned so many things that in my love of pursuing wisdom and knowledge, I had forgotten these other important things. And what is the what did Yeshua say in Mark when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God, all of your hearts, all mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love your neighbor. Hear, O Israel, hear and obey. That word here in the Hebrew is Shema. Shema is most accurately translated to mean hear and obey. So it's not just you hearing, like, okay, I got this knowledge, that's great. Okay, cool, that's nice, but you know, without, without acting it out, without being an example and a representative of God's character, you might know a lot of stuff, but it's kind of like, you know, when we meet the Father, what do we want to hear him say? Well done, good and faithful servant. He's not going to say, well thought, good and faithful, know it all. You know, you knew the stuff. You had that knowledge down pat. Good job. You know, welcome in. It's not about your knowledge. You can know a lot of stuff. That's great. But if all you do is spend your time debating and seeking um, to show people where they're wrong and how you're right, and if your motives are not pure, you're not walking like Yeshua. And you shouldn't speak if you're not speaking the words Yeshua would have spoken, which are words of correction and love. He loved the person, and so he spoke to them in the way they needed to hear it. And so when we speak, we need to make sure that we are speaking as Yeshua would speak, with that same humility, with the same patience, and with the correction of the Father from the Word, not our own pride sneaking in. <laughs> so as God grew me through that season of my life, um, he revealed so much more so that I was able to look even more like him, not just in the what I knew up here, but what I could do, what I could walk out physically. Now, this is not a, a workspace salvation at all whatsoever. This is simply that when we have accepted Yeshua as our Messiah, what is the witness of our faith? That we walk like he walked. In that same way, like James says, faith without works, faith without works is dead. I mean, if you start a race, you started the race, you accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, and then you plop down right after the, the beginner in the start line, because you said, you said the sinner's prayer, you're in, I'm saved, I'm good to go, I don't have to run this race, I'm already in. <laughs> you didn't make it to the finish line. We are to run the race with all endurance, which means if you fall down, you mess up, you, you do what I did, and um, become so zealous that I, I spoke out of my own pride instead of his love and humility. You know, I fell down. I didn't do it right in that moment. He's right there. Stand back up. Keep running that race. Keep pursuing the goal, which is Yeshua. To keep pursuing that goal of looking like Yeshua. Speaking like Yeshua. Acting, acting and walking like Yeshua. Running that race. So, and even though I had made some, um, mistakes in my zealousness in that season of my life. God had so much mercy and grace, and I'm so glad that he has revealed to me how to better be a representative of who he is in my life and my actions. And of course, I'm not there yet. I'm continually growing, but I'm thankful for his grace and for his mercy and for his love that he desires me to walk as Yeshua walked, and he's right there to help me to help me when I fall down, to be right there to help me stand back up again. And that same grace and mercy and love we need to extend to others around us. That when we have that, when we have something that God's revealed to us, that truth, that, that beautiful treasure that he's, you know, he's given to us, that we have that same grace and mercy and love and patience extended to the person that we've shared it with. That they can see it foremost in our lives. That we're not there to say, hey, you got to get this. Okay, let me just make sure that I uh, hit you a little more over the head with it until you get it. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is that you show it in your life 
and they can see and say, wow, what's different about you? Why, why, what, what? I want to know why this is different about your life and why you don't do what other people do. I want to know more because they see you walking in love and humility. I'm not talking about a wishy-washy kind of love, uh, an all-accepting kind of love where anything goes and there's no standard of holiness. I'm talking about a love like Yeshua. Because when we love like Yeshua, we will desire to love the Father also. We will desire to love His Word, which means to love His standards of holiness, of righteousness, and what that looks like, and what that looks like also in loving our neighbor. And before I belabor (laughs) um, this, I guess the main other thing is the fact that as I grew, another challenge came across my path. Hey, I'm 20 years old, 21. 22. All my friends are getting married. You know, uh, <laughs> hey, gotta, don't forget about me. I'm here too. And the next challenge that I faced was, oh, into the next challenges, there was always things that God was growing me in. But one other challenge that I think will tie into, um, you can say my testimony or how God's grown me. Because really testimony is just a story of what God's done in your life. And this other part of this testimony is as a single as a single woman and uh, God had to grow me that you know what it's okay to be single everyone else can be dating getting relationships getting married but you need to first find your fulfillment in the father and he had to really teach me this lesson for years and years. I watched people get married and I you know six years later someone I had known and been friends with and they've been married already for six years and like wow God this is that's that's wonderful for them but you know what about me? Maybe there isn't anyone for me and you know and I became you know saddened in my heart. But that's when he had to really speak to me that my my focus was in the wrong place. Because if I'm looking for someone to fulfill me or to meet my needs or to to just be someone who loves me, which, you know, we all want to be loved. We all desire to be loved. But if that was my sole motive or my focus, then that's imbalanced and it's wrong. And so God grew me even in that, that as I desired this, he taught me to rather put that desire down and let it be placed into his hands. Because what does the scripture say? He knows the desires of our heart. And what's important is that when we give him our desires, he'll give us his desires. And what's so beautiful about that is that then we feel that, that oh my goodness, like just, just the fulfillment, like the wow. He has filled us up so fully, really that full filled. He's like fully filled with him. And we no longer have that, that aching, that desire in the same way where we feel like we're nothing if we don't have this or we don't have that because he filled me so fully and that for a number of you know years I thought you know if I never get married that's fine because that's not what completes me I'm already complete in him I'm already complete in what he's done for me and what he's doing in me and what he will do and I'm excited to serve the Lord you know even if I, I never get married and that's okay and that took a while to get to that point I will say Um, He had to grow me and I had to, yeah, I really had to trust in him with all my heart and not my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge him and let him direct my paths. And it was kind of funny because not that long, you know, a while after, but not that long after I finally gave this thing up to him, you know, like, oh my goodness, it was a hard thing to give up. Okay, God, if I never get married, okay, fine, you can have it. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'm good now. Thanks. Um, <laughs> after I gave that to him and I really let him keep it and I didn't try to take it back and I let him hold that desire and I decided to chase after him and find excitement and joy and fulfillment in him alone. But long later, God decided to wreck my plans of being a single person, running after him alone to say, okay, by the way, uh, <laughs> I do have someone for you because you're ready now. <laughs> That's when God brought Petey into my life. I hadn't been ready before. If I had met Petey before, my focus would have been in balance. I would have been looking for someone who would make me happy and 
would will love me and and those aren't things that are bad but if we leave god out of the picture this person makes me happy this person fulfills me this person will complete me no one can complete you only god no one can make you truly happy give you true joy but the father and so in that God had to teach me this lesson. And when I had was finally ready, that's when he brought PD along. And in even that, I remember when PD and I first um, started speaking, one of our first conversations was even on both his side and my side. My focus was still purely on, I'm running after the Lord with all of my heart. I'm okay with never getting married. So even though I started talking a little bit with PD um, about just scripture, just things relating to God and the Bible, I wasn't thinking about anything else. And neither was Petey. One of our first conversations was even how we're both content being single because even Paul said you can do more things when you're single and you know there's a place for those who are married and there's a place for those who are single and we are just excited for what God is doing in our lives being single and we're not looking for anything else. <laughs> um, so ironically, God decided to, um, yeah, about a month and a half or two months later, just reveal that no, actually, because your hearts are in the right place and you're both ready because you both sought fulfillment in me. Yeah, she's the one for you and he's the one for, for me. So in that, that was such a, a major, a major moment of my life. And really, I guess you can say that to sum up uh, what I've shared of my testimony thus far of how God's grown me in these areas is really just trusting in Him. When things seem crazy, when things seem like illogical or just like going back to where we were attending a non-denominational church and things were going fine until all of a sudden, wow, we're going to keep the festivals now. This is weird. This is this is not normal. This is kind of crazy. And what do we do now? That's okay. Just trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. And guess what? An amazing journey later, he's grown us so much, he's grown me so much to, to desire the fullness of his word and to, to walk in the fullness of what that looks like and to see the joy and the depth and the beauty in the entire word of God from Genesis to Revelation and to desire the, the fullness of what it means to walk like Yeshua walked and the fullness of spirit and truth. And as he revealed that, oh my goodness, it changed my life, but it required us to trust in him when things didn't make sense because it doesn't always make sense when he says, step out of the boat, like Peter did. When Yeshua was walking on water, that was pretty crazy. I mean, like, yo, walking on water? <laughs> and the disciples thought he was a ghost until they realized, oh, it's, it's Yeshua, wow, okay. You know, that was definitely not normal. But then Peter had this, this crazy idea, like, oh, well, hey, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll step out of the boat because I want to walk to you. I want you so much. And I have so much faith and trust in you that I will step out of this boat. And I said it was stormy, that it was waves. It wasn't like this placid sea. It was crazy, but he did it anyways. Now, of course, the mistake Peter made is we look down at his own feet. That's when we start to trust in our own understanding. We're like, oh, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going and I, I'm confused. And, and that's when we start to sink. And that's when for me, when I was focusing on, well, oh God, is, you haven't given me anyone. I, is there anyone for me? I was trusting my own understanding of that and what that looked like and, and, and what do I do and, you know, am I doing it wrong? And all these different things of what I was, it was about my understanding. And I had to just give it all up because it, it's not, my, it's not something I can take care of. It's out of my control <laughs> to leave it in his hands, to place it fully. No strings attached and to take my hands off it. Once you put it into God's hands, you don't just leave one hand there ready to kind of take it back <laughs> when things start to not seem like they're going right. No, you, you let it go. You remove your hands fully. You step out of the boat and you don't look at your feet. You just keep walking towards Yeshua because when you trust in him with all your heart, he will show you the path you are to take. He'll show you the person you are to talk to. He'll show you to turn right or to turn left because you'll know his voice so well because you will have that intimate relationship with him and when you grow in that intimate relationship with him because you have studied his word and not only studying his word but you're applying it in your life you're having an active prayer life worship life and you're desiring to just to walk into the spirit and the gifts that he has given you through his spirit and to walk and to look like yeshua 
when that happens, well, first of all, your life changes in just a drastic and a beautiful and powerful way. You realize that God pours out his blessings on you in such, in such a more beautiful and powerful way. In my life, it's not always an easy road to blessings. Sometimes it's kind of up and down. But he does bless you in ways that you could never have imagined. He's blessed me with my husband, Petey. He's blessed me with just the, the, the love for his the word and understanding so many of these things that I hadn't known before, but now I do praise the Lord. And it was a rocky road to, to trying to get this thing right. But when you just have a heart to simply and humbly love and serve him, he will honor that. And so kind of coming back to it, really, I want to encourage you, even in this testimony, as God's grown me and in my life and in my walk and in my faith, that even when things seem crazy, you don't see the, the end. You just see where you are right now. You don't see what's around the corner, what the next chapter or the next page will look like. Maybe you're in a really difficult place in your life and just things, everything's going wrong or there's something really bad that's happened, um, sickness or someone who's passed or the fact that you're single and you're waiting on your life partner or you have lost um, something really important to you in whatever way that might look like. I want to encourage you to again lay these cares, these desires, these worries this pain, anything that's on your heart right now, lay them before his throne. Place it into his hands because he can care and he does care for you as the scripture says. He formed you and he created you. He loves you. And he knows you and he has called you by name for a great and mighty and powerful purpose that only you can fulfill and only you can walk out because it is meant for you. You individually, you specifically, with the specific talents and skills that God has given you. God prepared me for even what I'm doing now through <laughs> so much that he led me through in my life. Studying out scripture and spending hours and hours of my free time as a teen just studying scripture and reading things in books and theological articles online because he just gave me this passion, this love, and that prepared me for what I'm doing now. But I didn't know that then. I just loved him so much that I jumped head head in and now I'm able to do even and walk out this ministry that God's given me as a gift alongside my husband Petey. But it was because I was obedient then that I'm able to do what I'm able to do now, that I'm able to receive this blessing, this responsibility, <laughs> but this blessing in the same way. And it's kind of funny because even even in that way, you know, when I was younger, uh, when I was a child and a teen, I had a lot of weaknesses and things I had to get over and hardships. I had a speech disability. I tended to stutter. I tended to, to kind of slur my words and just not, I couldn't pronounce my R's at all. <laughs> I had to even go to a speech therapist um, just so I could learn how to pronounce my R's. And even when I spoke in public, I was so shy. I had so much anxiety about speaking in front of anyone, even speaking to people just face to face gave me anxiety. I was very shy. I was very shy. And yet God grew me in such a way because I simply desired to, you know what, God, you've given me so much. And if I'm the only person here who can share this truth, then God use me, even though I'm 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 not qualified. <laughs> I feel like Moses, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. <laughs> quote fiddler on the roof but if I'm the only one how can I say no oftentimes when we find ourselves in situations or speaking to a specific person or finding us in a, a certain place in that moment you're the only one who can speak the truth God has revealed to you the truth of Yeshua as our Messiah or the truth of the beauty of the festivals and how Yeshua is revealed in them or whatever that might be in that moment you're the only one so will he step out in faith or will he let a fear or um, something like a weakness hold you back? I had that weakness with speaking and speech, but thank the Lord, God healed me from that. And even now, from then, I've spoken in front of audiences of more than 100. And this is not to boast. This is simply to boast in the Lord and what he's done in my life. And now even I'm speaking on camera and that's 
it's kind of crazy actually because as PD will tell you I <laughs> I told him before I do not like speaking in front of cameras <laughs> but here I am because you know what God will use our weaknesses and he'll turn them around and even make them strengths because when we are weak he is strong and we rely on his strength not our own strength you can't say well I'm not good in that so I can't do it that's not my calling you know hey guess what I have news for you when Yeshua gave the Great Commission, he said, go out to all nations, make disciples, speaking the words, and sharing the commandments I have given you. And that's not just for teachers and preachers and pastors and missionaries, that's for everyone. So whatever way that looks like for you, it might look different, it might look the same, it might be in front of audiences of hundreds, it might be in front of an audience of five. It might be to your family, it might be to the guy down the street, or your next door neighbor. But it's having that heart, the humble heart of simply, I love the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And because I love him so much, I want to do what he's commanded me to do. To go out and to speak his word. To go out and to love my neighbor. To walk and to speak with a humility and a patience. And to speak the truth of the word, because remember what Yeshua says, thy word is truth, the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, not taking bits and parts out of context to, to fit my doctrine, or my pet doctrine, or this, you know, no, we need to go straight to the word of God, and we need to preach and speak his word without our own bias, without our own things that, are, that might be important to us in out of balance because sometimes we find something that is so important to us and that becomes the only thing we will ever talk about you know we've discovered this one thing and that's that's now everything and if you want to be saved you need to you need to understand this one thing and and by the way it's not Yeshua crucified it's not no we need to make sure we have our priorities straight that we are in our lives and actions speaking and preaching the whole word of God and representing his character in everything we do but oftentimes it requires us to do, or to, to do crazy things, to step out of the boat. It required, you know, me to answer this email, or this uh, Facebook message from this guy I didn't know. <laughs> but I researched him and found out he has a YouTube ministry and he's on fire for the Lord. And wow, that was different. He's from South Africa and now he's here in America. It was a weird situation. It's not the normal thing. You know, I met someone online. A lot of times people think, wow, that's crazy. You met him online. Are you, are you sure he's okay? <laughs> you know, and yeah, he's, he's definitely okay. <laughs> but sometimes God requires us to do kind of crazy things. But that's when we have his discernment. We can discern and we, because we hear his voice and we know his voice. When to speak, when not to speak. When to go, when not to go. When to turn right, when to turn left. And all of that's because we have an intimate relationship with him. And we've grown, and we have grown daily. It's not a one time a week thing that, okay, I've, I've done my thing, I've, I've gone to congregation, I've gone to church, and I've read my Bible, and I've got this. Okay, the rest of the week is mine. So that day is yours, God, but the rest of the week is mine. That's not the way it works with a relationship with the Father. It's not a, you know, a... a uh, it's not like a flip-flopping kind of relationship where it's, it's a uh, him here today and me here tomorrow and it's what I want to do now and maybe I'll do what you want to do tomorrow when I get some time. Or no, not at all. It's an either it's an all-in relationship. If you desire to love the Lord, you have to be all in, because that's what He requires. He requires all of you. He requires us to even be like Yeshua, to offer ourselves, like Paul talks about, as a living sacrifice. That we don't hold anything back. Because the moment we hold anything back, that's when we hold it back from Him being able to transform that part of our life so that we can look more like Him. And so that we end up holding this thing, this, this pain or this desire or whatever it is, so closely and that it can begin destroying us. But when we give him everything, when we give him all that we are, that's when we can look like Yeshua. Because we've emptied ourselves so fully that he can fully fill us. And that we can look more like him. And so in that, you know what? Sometimes God takes us on a journey. And sometimes there's ups and sometimes there's downs. 
Sometimes there's really difficult moments and sometimes it seems to be going well. But in each of those moments, if things are going easy, we find it easy to forget God. We got this, God. It's easy. We don't, we don't need you right now. It's in the hard times we cry out to the Lord and say, oh my goodness, everything's just crashing down around me. Where are you, God? But where were you when things were easy? He was there, but where were you? You know, it's kind of interesting when you read the book of Revelation. We hear about the angels singing, holy, 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 you know, are you Lord God of hosts? And just imagine the angels singing, holy, holy, holy. I would say day in, day out, day out, but there's no day and night there, just continuously singing this holy, holy, holy. But yet these angels have never experienced the same kind of thing we've experienced. We've, they've never been redeemed or restored from the, the, the pain of the sin, the curse of sin and death that we have through Yeshua been redeemed from. They never experienced living in a cursed world where there's, there is this death, there is this, this curse that is overtaken. They have never experienced that loss and that, that hopelessness that we have without Yeshua. And yet they sing holy, holy, holy. How much greater can we who have experienced the great and mighty work that Yeshua has done in our lives, how he has rescued us from bondage to slavery, sin and death. How he's rescued and brought us out of that. We can look back at things that we, where we had been in our life. If God's taken us out of a great darkness, he has brought us into a great light. And how even more can we sing, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God, because you have done such a great and mighty work in my life. Because you love me so much. Because you gave your son, Yeshua, to die, to take the penalty, the consequence of my sin, which is death. I should have died. But Yeshua took that penalty for me and he died for me because he loved me so much. So how much greater of a reason do we have to sing holy, holy, holy to our Father, to praise his name, creator of heavens and the earth, who sent his son to save us from our sin. How much greater reason do we have to sing holy, holy, holy? But can we expect to one day sing holy, holy, holy if we are not now living holy, holy, holy? If in our lives, in our day to day, if we're not walking this out, if we're not running this race, if we're not trusting in him with all of our heart and leaning not on our own understanding, if we're living a life for him, how can we sing holy, holy if we're not even living holy? Not in a prideful, not in an arrogant way of, you know, I, I've got this knowledge and I look different from you and I want to make sure you see my holiness. That is not, that is not the character of our Father. That is not what Yeshua did. That is what certain Pharisees did so that they could get the glory and that people could look to them and see their holiness instead of reflecting the Father's holiness. And that's what we are to do. When we strive to walk a set apart life and to walk in holiness, we are to do so by reflecting his holiness and what he calls holy in his word. The Father calls us to live set apart lives for him, that we are to look more like him, that we are to look more like the example that he's given us through Yeshua, through his son. And it's, sometimes it'll look different than we thought it would look. Sometimes it means, like I said earlier, that we do something crazy and we step out of the boat, that we celebrate Passover, even though that's weird and we've never done that before, and we don't know what we're doing, but we simply want to love him and honor him. And if he says it's his appointed time for his people, then what's important to him is important to us. And in that same way, I just want to encourage you, even in my testimony, that as God, has, as a father has grown me in so many areas of my life and and just helped me grow closer to him in just so many different details and so many different things that I had struggled with and that have now brought me closer to him, I wanna encourage you that, you know what? Every season, God uses every season to grow us if we let him. It's a difficult season if it's things are going well 
use that time for his glory wherever you are in whatever form or fashion or whatever's going on in your life right now use that and allow god to use that in your life to bring him glory through the words you say through the actions that you do and so that others can see his light shining through you and that they can be brought to him even through your life through your faith in these moments and how you constantly point to him and you point up not to yourself but you point up to him so that they see his love just pouring out through you just like an open an overflowing vessel that we're supposed to be overflowing with his holy spirit with his love for those around us and that they can witness that so that no matter what is going on they see there's something different about us because we're not reacting in the same way that you know any unbeliever might that we are different we find our, our comfort, we find our strength, we find our hope, find our foundation in the Father. This is um, <laughs> a portion of my testimony and I hope it encouraged you and blessed you. Blessings and shalom.